Bright learners! <laughs> Hello! Good to see you again! Okay, today we are doing chapters 28 through 33 of How to Eat Fried Worms. Six chapters. Are you ready? Let's go. Find bright learners. <sighs> Chapter 28. <clears throat> Hello, we're... A confused murmur rose up and down the street. Suddenly, a boy shouted from the Phelps house, Thanks! Alan's father dragged him back from the window. Is that why you were stuffing Billy with candy and junk all day? You leave me alone. Yeah, we were trying to trick him. The Finks! Finks! He yelled at the top of his voice, lunging towards the window. Shh, quiet! His father sat him down hard on a chair. Joe peered furtively out through the thin fringe of the bedspread. As soon as he had heard the siren and Tom's yells, he had crawled under the bed. And that's why Billy woke the whole neighborhood up, to show you he hadn't been tricked. Yes. His father let go of Alan's pajama collar. <clears throat> In the doorway, Alan's mother threw up her hands and went off to the bathroom to take two aspirin. Let's get rid of our window. <clears throat> the next day, Alan and Joe tramped from house to house in the neighborhood, knocking on each door and then reciting in chorus. Hello, we're Alan Phelps and Joseph O'Hara. We're the reason you were waked up in the middle of the night last night, and we're sorry. You'll be happy to know our parents have punished us. We can't look at television or have any dessert for a month, and our allowances have been taken away for two weeks. We promise that it will never happen again. At least not in this neighborhood, muttered Joe, as the last door closed behind them. And Alan, said his father at dinner that night, I don't want to hear that there's been any repetition of this incident at Billy's or Tom's house or anywhere else. Do you understand that? We can't let them get away with it, Mr. Phelps, called Joe from the living room where he was waiting for Alan to finish dinner. There will be no repetition of this incident. Incident or anything like it, repeated Mr. Phillips. You tried to trick Billy and lost. That will be the end of the matter. Chapter 29. <clears throat> you know what you are? Said Alan, his nose almost touching Billy's. You're a bastard. And you're another, sneered Billy through clenched teeth. Ain't a cheating lying, dirty, snot-nosed, cheating, lying one. If you say two more words, said Alan, you know what? I'll beat your head in. Billy breathed hard. I'm right behind you, muttered Tom, peering grimly over Billy's shoulder, his fist clenched. Yeah, said Joe from behind Alan, so what? We can lick both of you with our hands tied behind our backs and paper bags over our heads. You couldn't lick a flea. Yeah, yeah. Spiffle, whack, thump. Someone's choking, no fair. Thwomp, gouge. Joe crawled off behind a tree, his nose bleeding. Whomp, he's pulling hair. He's scratching. Twist, twist. Alan crawled, weeping behind a bush. Thump, whack, dump. Billy, it's just you and me. Where are the others? Tom and Billy untangled and set up, bruised, scratched, dusty, their shirts torn, their hair tousled. Tom's nose was bleeding. Billy's shoe would come off. Yeah, yeah, sassed Alan and Joe from behind a tree. Billy started to shake his fist at them and clamber up, but then sank back. Tom panted beside him, bleary-eyed. Yeah, yeah, all worn out, can't fight anymore. Alan scooped up a handful of mud and flung it at Tom and Billy. Ooh, let's get some mud. It's too spotty, isn't it? Too perfect. <clears throat> Tom scrambled up and pelted back. Mud splattered against trees and bushes. Alan began to cry. A rock hit Billy over the eye. He sat back down in the mud, covering his head with his arms, sobbing. <laughs> Joe and Tom stopped throwing. Joe grabbed Alan. Come on. 
Tom knelt beside Billy. Let me see, Billy. Is it bad? Take your arms away so I can see. He tried to pull Billy's arms apart. Billy wrenched away. Come on, said Tom in a scared voice. I'll take you home. Come on. Your mom can take you to the doctor. Chapter 30. The Peace Treaty. Alan and Joe sat on the sofa. Tom and Billy on two straight chairs opposite them. Now, said Alan's father, what's all this about? The four boys all began talking at once, accusing, recounting, explaining. All right, said Alan's father after a while. That's enough. Now, we know it's got something to do with this bet Alan and Billy made, but Mr. O'Hara and I aren't going to get involved in that. You'll have to settle that among yourselves. You four boys have been friends for too long to start fighting now, said Mr. O'Hara. You really hurt each other. Look at yourselves. Your face is all bruised and muddy. Talk it over. Work it out. And then you can shake and be friends again. Joe muttered under his breath. I couldn't be friends with those rats. We'll be out in the kitchen, said Alan's father. When you've settled it, call us and we can all go down to Friendly's for some ice cream, okay? Billy and Alan and Tom nodded. The two fathers left the room. The boys gazed silently at each other. After a while, Alan said, It wasn't us that scratched Tom. Billy did it. Another silence. Did you have stitches? Billy asked Alan. No. Nah. Did you? Billy shook his head. More silence. You tried to cheat, said Billy. That wasn't cheating. We were just trying to trick you. Yeah, but before that, when you glued the two worms together, that was cheating. You would have cheated, too, if you'd been losing. Billy thought about it. <sighs> okay, but look, no more cheating. I've already eaten 13 worms. You know I can eat two more, heck. If I buy George Cunningham's brother's mini bike, we can all use it. We'll all have fun with it. Joe and Alan glanced at each other. Okay, said Joe. You win. He wins, Alan. Yeah, but... What's the use, said Joe. We tried everything. I'm sick of it. Geez, we've done nothing else for almost four weeks. <sighs> yeah. Alan scratched his eyebrow, glancing at Joe. Yeah, but... Joe stood up. Come on, at least we'll get a milkshake out of it. I think we need to have some ice cream just because we can. Okay. Chapter 31. The Letter. Billy lifted the worm out of the frying pan with the cooking tongs and curled it back and forth on his peanut butter sandwich. I bet they try something, he said. Joe won't give up. Alan might, but Joe won't. Tom was carving his initials in the leg of the kitchen table. Yeah, but it's not Joe's bet. What does he care? Just the same. I bet he tries something. Billy sat down at the table, turning the sandwich this way and that, looking for the best spot to take the first bite. Emily came in from the dining room. You and Mom got a letter. Chewing. Billy opened up. Hmm. Hold, I'll get a letter. <laughs> Dear Mrs. Forrester, I have just made a distressing discovery. Through a medical journal, before going up to bed, I noticed an article entitled Poisons in the Home Garden, a subject which necessarily fascinates me. As I glanced through the article, a phrase caught my eye, Lubricus testisterus, the common earthworm, I read on. Mrs. Forrester, let me assure you that there is first of all no cause for undue alarm. However, you will, I am sure, be concerned to learn that, quote, especially in the months of July and August, parents must be aware of the common earthworm, some varieties of which are known to secrete a substance, lubricus corporeus, which, though not malignant to the skin, is sometimes harmful if swallowed. Dr. A.C. Roosevelt of Hyde Park, New York, reports that 10% of the boys studied reported no ill effects, except induced paralysis of the lower fulmar region. 
40% reported abdominal cramping, triple vision, lasting from two to three years and impining school performance and extreme lassitude autopsy reports and have not yet been retrieved on the remaining 50%. And so no final conclusions can be drawn, but extreme caution is urged since the blackened and pimply faces of the subjects lead one to suppose the worst. Mrs. Forrester, as your friend and family physician, I would strongly recommend that your son William eat no more worms until I return on Thursday from New York City and can give him a thorough examination. Yours sincerely, C. M. McGrath, M. D. Chapter 32 Croak. His hand trembling, Billy laid the peanut butter and fried worm sandwich on the table. Do you think? Wow, whispered Tom. The screen door banged. Billy's father came into the kitchen. His tie loosened, his jacket over his arm. He laid his briefcase on the table. It's hot, he said cheerfully. Billy staggered to the sink and feebly drew himself a glass of water. Tom and Emily watched him, awestruck. What's the matter? said Billy's father. Water dribbled down Billy's chin and onto his t-shirt as he drank. His mind swam. Poison? Paralysis? Extreme lassitude? Tom, said Billy's father, what's going on? Tom pointed at the letter lying on the table. Billy's fa father read it, smiled, glanced at Billy, and getting a beer out of the refrigerator, sat down at the table. Well, he said to Billy, so it fooled you, eh? Fooled me croaked Billy. Chapter 33. The 14th Worm. But how could Alan and Joe know all those medical words, Mr. Forrester? said Tom. Lumbrucius corporeus? Fulmar? <laughs> Do you really know what fulmar means? Tom and Billy shook their heads. It means a bird, a seabird, I think. Boy, said Billy, disgusted. He sank back down at the table and picked up his sandwich. They could be arrested, Mr. Forrester, said Tom. Couldn't they be arrested for defrauding the males, couldn't they? Billy grinned and bit down the peanut butter and fried worm sandwich. All right, that's it. Next time, chapter 34 and on. <laughs> Bye, Bright Learners. See you soon. Remember to read good books.